which is being placed on thinking in contemporary education today. So to help this um, engagement so that you could also follow what I'm saying and you could also build upon some of the ideas which I'll present, I thought I'd share a PowerPoint with you. So which will summarize some of the basic points I'm saying, which may make it a little more um, you know, engaging for you. So let me um, just a second, if I can just uh, choose this, yeah. So let me share this um, PowerPoint and it's called teaching thinking. So I'm beginning with the idea that you can actually teach thinking and thinking is a value that has to be taught and communicated. So the question is, how do I do it and why do I want to do this? So the first question uh, we can go back to is to the very fundamental questions about teaching and namely the goals of teaching. And this is something which all of us as teachers have struggled all the time. What does it actually mean to teach? What is this activity of teaching? So I go to a class, I have students in front of me, I'm looking at them and then I'm supposed to teach. And we should remember that for a large number of people, definitely in the Indian context where professionalization of disciplines are never given, is never given the kind of respect it demands. So anybody in a sense can do any of the so-called soft sciences, which includes the social science and humanities. So you would have people just because they do a PhD, they are immediately enter into your classroom. And this is actually a big problem because you have done PhD, for example, let's say as a research work, sitting in a lab and doing something. But what, how does it train you to teach? And in this kind of a belief that you somehow get a degree, an advanced degree and walk into your class to teach is basically reduces teaching to transmission of knowledge, some knowledge about some subject matter. So this is something which is very contentious. And I'm sure that all of you have thought a lot about it. And definitely in the context of uh, school learning and even the early parts of higher education, it is not just about walking into your classroom and saying, I know this and now I'm going to tell that to you. Because right from how do you tell that to them, how you communicate that knowledge, how you transmit that knowledge, etc., have deep influence on how, what, how the students learn and what the students learn. So transmission of content alone, obviously, which is something which I'm sure many of you have, uh, I mean, some of this is obviously repetitive, perhaps since you're all uh, education students, but I want to set the background to make an argument about what is thinking and how does one teach thinking. So uh, just communication transmission, uh, so many students, teachers might say, I just have a syllabus, I have a book, I'm going to write on the board, I'm going to tell you what it is, and you write it down, etc. I mean, that's there's a model, and you know, there are good and bad things about any model. So I don't want to take positions about these models, but these are all practices which many of you are aware. But you could look at teaching in a little more broader context. It is not just as a person who is transmitting and communicating what is there in a syllabus or what is there in a textbook, but is a mediator. So the teacher functions as a mediator. Mediator is somebody who is in between right, who is in between the book and the student. So the, there is a content, there is a discipline. A book can stand for a syllabus, it can stand for a discipline. So you can communicate a discipline, but you can also mediate between the discipline, the content, knowledge content present in the discipline and the student. And this is, uh, mediation is a very larger meaning. I mean, it has many more connotations. Mediation could be in so many different ways. So the way you mediate, the way you transmit, the way you change the content in order to transmit to students is a very important function of what a teacher is. So that mediation could be in terms of explanation, contextualization, putting that knowledge in a particular content, being like a guide to students, you know, the imagery of uh, as a, uh, somebody who is guiding the students towards the content of the book without forcing the students or without uh, feeding the students etc so there are so many metaphors around this idea of uh, uh, teaching which i'm sure all of you have thought about and there are various other kinds of larger social practices around what is it to teach and that many teachers i definitely do not think teaching is just about communicating some knowledge which is present in a book to some other uh, some students um, while we may, there, while there are a lot of dangers, inherent dangers in personalizing the act of teaching, like being a parent and friend, etc. Um, you know, there are also very important um, 
reasons for looking at a teacher as more than just a particular kind of a, a, a tube from which some knowledge flows from one end to the other. So these are some of the basic questions which would start making us thinking about what is it to teach? What does this activity of teaching actually mean? Now, now that we are teachers, you could also raise the question about what is it that we teach? So let's assume that I have some sense of activity as a teacher. You can choose whatever you want or a combination of all of this. But then what do I teach? Do I teach just the lessons? Do I teach the information in the lessons? Do I teach every word in the book? So do I come to class and read everything in the syllabus or in the book which I want to read? Or what is it that I actually want to do? Do I choose what information I should transmit? In which case, you're already becoming a mediator because you are choosing what is important for the students to learn. So how do you actually understand, uh, even if you know what this act of teaching is, what you would choose to teach? And by framing syllabus, by giving us books or uh, readings, etc., is one helpful point, but it can never be de deterministic of what teaching is, because you cannot, as I said, transmit the book in its entirety to the student. So there is something else you're already doing. You are actually doing something to the content, which you are then processing in your own manner, and which you then give to the student. The book or the content of knowledge is never transmitted directly. There is no direct transmission between the content and the student. The teacher has to assimilate, do something with the content, recreate it in her own image, recreate it in the way she understands it, which is then transmitted. So the whole idea that you know, you're actually teaching content um, is actually a very big problem because it is impossible to teach content. That's the first point. But we therefore end up teaching content in a very um, blind manner. We're actually probably missing out on a very important aspect of what teaching is. Now, the third question we could ask, once we know what teaching, what the activity of teaching is, is and what we choose to teach, etc., is how to teach it. So let's assume I want to teach a lesson. And let's assume I want to teach some Newton's laws of motion. How am I going to teach it? And that is another very important question, which all of you have thought about, which I'm not going to talk any, any more at all about this. But just the very simple point which I want to use this to enter into our discussion is how to teach depends on what you're going to teach and what is the act of teaching and so on. And one of the fundamental questions here is actually about learning. And that's why we, we often use teaching learning as a, a common term rather than a very independent terms. And here the question really is, what should a, teacher, a student learn from a teacher? Is the student going to learn uh, the information in the book? Or is it about uh, knowledge of what is in the discipline? Or is it about particular skills of solving problems in a very fast manner or writing essays? Or is it larger about ethical conduct or conduct, social conduct? How does one uh, perform and function in a society? How does one understand notions of social responsibility and so on? Is that also something which a student is supposed to learn from a teacher? And this is very important because today, many of our old paradigms of teaching have gone for a toss. And it is no longer, uh, even, even if we did have in between a period where you thought teaching was just about knowledge and transmitting knowledge and not about some kind of a, you know, an, a, you know citizenship, training them in social conduct, etc. Today, it is completely gone out of uh, the door because there are the different kinds of problems which have come in the context of the go uh, in the context of teaching. And one of the problems which is uh, <clears throat> very important is, of course, about the digital world and the fact that teachers have become redundant for two reasons. One, that they you can access any book. You know, earlier, 20 years before, if I was teaching, I still had access to the book. I was the gatekeeper to the books. And I would come to class and say, OK, I'm going to read this. And you can you know, do whatever you want, you know, whichever way I want to transmit that information to the students. Today, students have more access to uh, more books than I can ever think of. They, I, they can just pull out any of the books from anywhere in the world. They have access to, uh, with all the kinds of gatekeeping which is happening, there is still a lot more access to information and content than ever before. 
So in that kind of a situation, what does it mean to teach? So all the questions we talked about, what does it mean to teach? Well, how do I teach? What do I teach? Are all undergoing a massive change today, and we need to figure out how to understand this. You can, uh, teachers become redundant because I don't even need to sit in a class and have a teacher because the teachers are coming across the world. Online teaching, as we have seen, especially in COVID time, has become so prominent. And I'm doing this right now to all the courses for the last one year, which I teach. And you know, there are I can see that there are uh, both positives and negatives, but it's becoming a very important influential model. So, in that sense, a very simple question and a much it's actually a simple but a quite a deep question, uh, which you know those of you who want to think about it from different disciplinary practices should think about why is a physical teacher needed at all. Do you need teachers at all? Do they need any of us to go into a classroom and look at the student in the eye and do anything with them? Tell them, teach them. Now, one reason I would argue, and I'm, this is the basic argument I'm going to make in this uh, talk, is just this, that we need physical teachers. You need to have students in front of you. You need to be looking into the eyes and the faces of the students, and they need to be looking at you because as a teacher, I do not do anything that the online medium does. I do not do, I don't consider myself as a teacher because I'm transmitting content. I'm teaching, taking some knowledge and giving it somewhere else. I do not do that because my fundamental role as a teacher is to teach how to think. Thinking is my goal of teaching. And through thinking, I teach knowledge. I transmit questions of knowing how they, what, what should be learned, etc. But it's all done through the medium of thinking. And because of this, it is extremely important for us to recognize that teachers become far more important in the online world and the digital world today. In rather than saying uh, that actually we are now redundant, we don't need us because everything is there, because of this complete proliferation, this complete expansion of information, it becomes far more important to be a teacher today because our, our, our responsibility both in terms of you know, interconnecting knowledge systems, making, producing meaningful understanding of this surplus information, producing uh, uh, students who are you know, or citizens, people with you know, various kinds of social responsibilities and so on, becomes a central core of what teaching is going to be. So there is far more uh, urgent reason that Teachers have to come to the front now in this kind of this digital onslaught of various kinds. But if you look at, and again, if you look at some of the most important influences today across the world, including in India, including in the new uh, NEP policy, uh, in the NEP, is the emphasis on uh, teaching critical thinking, interdisciplinary thinking, and so on. So while this has always been a part of a larger global practice of education, for quite some time now, that thinking becomes somewhere, teaching thinking, making students critical and creative thinkers becomes a very important goal of teaching. Uh, it has also become now a kind of um, an, an ideal within the Indian education system uh, with all its plus and minuses. Again, we will not, unless there are specific questions, we'll talk about it later. But at least there is a there is now a public emphasis on these kinds of things. When you look at the kind of uh, public, uh, private universities which are coming up, it's, it's, it's not a great surprise since they are modeling themselves on certain global parameters that every or all these uh, private universities like Ashoka, Kriya, and others, uh, very expensive universities which are uh, producing these uh, students today, all of them have a courses on thinking. Something to do with critical thinking, interdisciplinarity, etc. So, the, you know, this is a particular kind of a global model. But much before it was a global model, many of us as teachers were actually doing this because we thought that it is that is our basic uh, mandate as a teacher. But having said that, it seems very simple. This looks like a one single prescription for teaching and saying, "Oh, teach them thinking." And, but the problem is, there's a great ambiguity on what thinking is. And there's a greater ambiguity in how do I teach thinking? I can tell students think, think, think. But what else, what more can I tell them? How else do I teach thinking for them? So the first thing to make sense of it is to try and understand what thinking actually means. 
and once we get uh, an idea of what thinking actually means you know maybe we will find better ways of teaching thinking that's my that's a basic motivation for uh, doing this particular uh, kind of analysis of thinking and i'm i'm going to choose two uh, very useful articles uh, papers if you like which um, i find very useful because of the typographies uh, typologies of thinking and its connection to education both of these are written uh, in education journals in the context of education and i and I, i have isolated these points and putting them in a particular way and i'm extrapolating on them to show you how one can uh, use these kinds of ways of understanding thinking to actually um teach thinking in very specific manner so i don't want to do a very theoretical um abstract way of saying this is what we should do i want to look at classroom practices how these kinds of thinking practices can translate uh, in ways in which we can teach thinking okay so the first point we have to recognize is that while there is so much of obviousness about thinking that we think everybody thinks children think and there are various interesting articles on whether animals think and so on um, thinking doesn't seem to it's like seeing right you open your eyes and a baby sees you don't need to be taught seeing because uh, as i said the moment a baby is born and opens its eyes it can see the world and at a particular time it probably starts thinking about the world nobody teaches babies to think although one has to define what does it mean to think for a baby etc but we just assume that no but there was no time in your life that somebody said this is how you should see they might tell you how to see particular things but nobody taught you what the act of seeing is and nobody i'm sure um, i don't remember it and i don't know anybody who who, who has told me that you know there was a particular time where they taught me to think they'll tell you that somebody taught them to do mathematics somebody taught them to draw and to dance and so on but nowhere is it that a particular moment in your life happens and you say oh somebody made me sit down and said okay now i'm going to teach you what thinking is we take it for granted and part of the problem is because it is we take it for granted but just like seeing is a skill and that seeing is not something which is just given to all of us and that what we mean by disciplines is teaching you how to see in fact you know you can look at signs in various ways but one of the most important ways of understanding what science is what is special to science is that it teaches you new ways of seeing it is able to teach you ways of seeing an atom and an electron which you can't see with your eyes but trains you to be able to recognize as different kinds of perception similarly in art you can't you just don't say open your eyes and say oh that's a nice painting or that's a bad painting or that's good music or bad music you have to be taught how to see and how to listen because it's a skill once i teach you how to look at a painting how to analyze it see the hidden dimensions in it you will then see the painting until then you are just looking at it similarly if you are just listening to music you are just hearing music but to listen to music is to teach you the skills of hearing and to say look did you notice that sound there did you know the sound which follows that kind of training so just like we have to be trained to see and to listen and to taste etc we also have to be trained to think and there are specific skills of uh, training to think one of the things which i do in all my thinking workshops even for children which i do is to spend some time with children because they all come into class especially you know i remember the one i did in delhi for example you know a lot of precocious kids obviously in delhi and they were like so sure about everything and so one of the first things we do is to start off with um, you know go back completely and i've i've done this even with adults and even with adults uh, you know children it's um, you know it's still a very good learning experience you just have to stop them and say okay you tell me what is happening to you when you think that is you make people self aware of the pra- of the act of thinking that's the first step for me that is you ask somebody suppose i say oh think about a particular issue and the person says oh okay, i'm thinking about it then i stop and say what is it that you're doing when you're thinking can you articulate it can you explain what is happening to your body is it that you're feeling very anxious when you're thinking do you get a headache when you think what is happening what is this activity of thinking in that sense and one so once i begin with that we build on various kinds of thinkings and so on but one way to 
make this very uh, may teach thinking very easily is to actually recognize that thinking is a skill that needs to be trained and there is not one thing which is called thinking it is not just one act it's not thinking like okay think about something fine i tell a student think about uh, think about you know let's say this uh, spread of covid what do i want the student to do thinking about spread of covid suppose i may say think about um, you know how we are going to how uh, migrant labor is going to deal with this issue now that's another kind of thinking that you do or i might say think about why the sky is blue what do i want the student to say when i say think about it and one of the ways to recognize and give us a better way of training and communicating thinking is to look at the classification of this thinking that i told you about and michael peters working from the educationist perspective in and it's basically coming from a philosophical understanding of what thinking is because uh, we should remember philosophy as a discipline one of the fundamental co concepts which is core to everything in philosophy is thinking many philosophers describe philosophy itself as thinking about thinking so th we do thinking but to think about thinking many philosophers think that is the task of philosophy so um this classification you know this is just a broad classification i'm giving you this classification because i want you to think about more kinds of categories which you can add which you can delete etc but just to show you that we can actually break up the kinds of thinking into different forms so next time i tell a student think i'm not just saying think i'm actually telling them to do one of these kinds of thinking that's a crucial point okay so um when people have thought about thinking so peter summarizes many of the philosophers ways of thinking about thinking and says well we can identify these kinds of thinking one kind of thinking is having an idea having a belief forming an opinion and that's form of thinking for example i might um, look at a crowd in some place in front of me and i might uh, uh, form an opinion that i don't want to be part of it i don't want to walk towards them because i don't want to be part of it and you have actually thought it's not that you saw them and you said i'm not going to go there because sometime in another context you may say oh let me go join them in some other context you say i won't join them even the simple decision or having a taking a particular forming any opinion or belief is already already involves thinking and it's a particular kind of thinking so you have to ask yourself how i'm standing here i see a crowd in front of me and i'm looking at them and deciding whether to go join them the very fact that i am thinking about whether i should join them or not itself points to the particular process of thinking so the this kind of thinking where you're forming an opinion or a belief is one kind of thinking that is a thinking which is very different from another kind of thinking which is representing the world describing you could call this describing which we do all the time when we talk about people we describe people we talk about societies we describe society if suppose you ask me can you describe the room suppose you are let's say you have a student in the class and you tell the student describe the classroom what you are asking the child to do is to think in a particular manner and description that is representing for example if the child says oh there are 20 uh, friends of mine in this room is very different from the child saying there are uh, 10 boys and 10 girls in this room so categories are already different between friends boys girls suppose a student says there are 20 human beings in this room that's a different category immediately which is being used suppose some child just to irritate the teacher says there are 20 animals in this room that's a different category each of them comes because of the specific way of thinking associated with the act of description when we describe we are actually doing an enormous amount of thinking behind it and that thinking is not having an opinion it is not a decision whether i'll join the crowd or not it's a completely different kind of thinking because i'm looking at the class a room let's say that i'm looking at the room right now where i'm sitting and i'm trying to describe the room windows doors what tables chairs etc which is very different from make having an opinion about something about some person or some people or whatever else it is so the question here is this when we tell children just think 
it's not enough because when you develop thinking skills in, in children or in any student even adult students you are actually you will recognize that different children and different students have different capacities for these different types of thinking so let's look at some more of these different type of thinking the third type which peters talks about is a ratiocination which is basically reasoning that's another kind of thinking that thinking is not like the description it's not like saying what the classroom is like it is it is asking the child to develop a particular set of arguments that is oh, this is one of the most important most fundamental aspects of thinking and this is actually quite simple it's got you know sometimes people confuse it with logic as a discipline and so on it's very simple it is that whenever we make a conclusion we are following a process of reasoning any conclusion the child uh, in a classroom might say i'm not going to have lunch in the school today because i don't like the lunch they give today so a simple thing like that already has a reason and if you ask why don't you like the uh, food today it might say something like oh i don't like uh, this food or that food or whatever it is the point is any time you conclude about anything whether it is 2 plus 2 equal to 4 or whether atoms make up the universe or whether democracy is good for a society whatever things you conclude or which restaurant you want to go and eat your lunch you have followed a particular form of reasoning this is what many people would reduce it to critical thinking but for me it is a whole set of other kind of skills about thinking which is present so already we are seeing three different types that is forming opinion describing something reasoning which is a movement from a series of steps coming to a conclusion already they are all different and we can look similarly at other kinds of things and i'll just give you some of them so we can go through them very quickly problem solving for example all uh, you know many especially in science teaching you know this like all the classes all the lessons will end with a set of problems to solve either in physics or mathematics and so on and problem solving is a particular kind of skill solving you know it's a particular kind of skill which you teach it's a lot of things to do with the tricks and remembrance memory there are a lot of very interesting ways of understanding problem solving uh, but problem solving is a particular kind of thinking it is not description it is not even reasoning reasoning is more broad right problem solving is i give you what is uh, you know 2 into 5 uh, plus 6 okay you have to solve the problem so a child might look at it and try and see how to solve it and it may you it will of course use questions of reasoning and so on but as a but uh, you know as it, it could be seen as a very different type of specific kind of problem uh, which may or may not be reducible to just one type of uh, reasoning and so on that's why i would see that it is a very uh, maybe that it is a different category but as i said the the point in giving you these categories is not to say that these are the primary ones and these are all the ones that there are but it's basically to show you how to think about creating categories as i said you can throw out a few of them you can say some of them are very similar um, and some of them doesn't in your view of thinking doesn't matter but that's not important the point is to recognize that there are different types of thinking and each of them need different skills of teaching so uh, just like um, description reasoning uh, forming opinions are very different like problem solving conceptual thinking is very different type of thinking it is not just like description describe the room i have a room in front of me i'm describing it with whatever uh, language i have but creating concepts is a completely different way of looking at the world a different kind of skill of thinking you are bringing to your teaching to the children or the students to be able uh, to uh, come up with new concepts it's like telling the uh, students in your class well let's say they describe your room by saying there are 20 friends in this room and you tell them look you cannot use friends you cannot use man uh, boys girls you cannot use uh, you know humans and animals and so on can you come up with some other concepts to describe our classroom and that that is an exercise which is a completely different kind of thinking and it's a very important as it's a foundational aspect of all research creativity and critical thinking so it's a uh, to me it's a very very important training that you need to do specifically and you have to train students 
individually in these kinds of thinking so that um, you know they may, see some students will always do better in uh, conceptual thinking some in uh, you know descriptions etc that doesn't matter but i'm talking in terms of my function as a teacher is to teach them all the skills of these different kinds of thinking and therefore i need to uh, f figure out some ways to do it okay there as i said peters gives various other categories they are not important i just wanted to give you the the basic idea that once you break up the thinking into different categories and then you recognize that many of them are different from each other and that it is just impossible to just say i'm going to teach thinking without saying which type of thinking you're going to teach and how you're going to teach that type of thinking the last kind of thing which i want to very very quickly um, mention here you can uh, look at this paper and download it in the web it's uh, it's uh, freely available it's uh, michael peters kinds of thinking styles of reasoning and the last kind of thing is like playing language games that's a great way for me of teaching thinking Th thinking is actually like a game we can do all these kinds of other things that's fine but one of the very important aspects of thinking is to teach it like a game is to teach it like ways in which people can play with languages producing different kind of language and playing something with it so now i mean you know, peter summarizes some of these from different philosophical ideas on thinking i want to try and uh, give um, you know since all of you or many of you may become teachers or interested in the questions of teaching i want to uh, suggest a way in which you convert this categories of teaching into classroom practices what is it that you will teach yeah how do you teach this kind of thinking so the first question for me is as we saw before teaching is not about content but actually more about how and why of the content that's extremely important for me that's why i don't like to teach books i mean you know uh, some of my students often get very irritated with me because i don't i don't like to teach um, you know great philosophers as they have said this something in a book for me that is secondary because i know the students can read it i mean what's a big deal what should, what should i be reading out what they have said to me the question is about how to read a book becomes far more important how to read the text how do you teach them to be able to understand why the author is writing that not what the author is saying i'm not interested in what the author is saying beyond a particular point i yes i want to know what they says because i'm going to use it in some sense but more important as a as a teacher for me it is to tell the student think about how, how and why the author is saying what she is saying that's very important so when if we know that belief formation is there we all have beliefs okay i'm sure all of us have various beliefs about politics about various things of that kind and you know i think including in our lives or in our teaching the point is not about the beliefs but point is how were these beliefs formed and can you be aware of them so when children come to us and say that there are for example suppose they say there are 20 uh, 10 boys and 10 girls in the classroom you ask them to do a exercise of description they say that and i would ask them not whether their answer is right or wrong whether there are really 10 boys or 10 girls but i would be interested to know what kind of thinking led them to make this distinction between boys and girls in the classroom and how that is the process of thinking and that is that process where you start getting them confused where you start getting them to ask oh could i have done it in a different manner and this is a very simple exercise which is a very good way of teaching thinking for example in description that that skill of describing something which is one type of thinking which is to say well ask students to describe something and then tell them now you have to read describe it in a completely different manner and do it in a third different manner do it in a fourth different manner whatever depending on whatever time and patience you have you will have to uh, do this kind of descriptive exercises which are uh, which makes the students recognize that something cannot is not describable in only one way that you can describe them in so many different ways i mean if you look at a politics for in india for example today you know there's all this thing which who is an indian and what is it to be an indian for example which i see very unfortunately has come into our school systems too then you can tell a child okay uh, describe what it is to be an indian so they'll write it now the question then is not to evaluate it and say right or wrong but to be able to say now can you describe it in a completely different way 
and it's going to be difficult because the child thinks oh this is the only way we have been taught to describe it but you're forcing this child to think to think can i describe what is it in indian in another way and after doing that again it's not about right or wrong now it's an exercise in thinking not about the content you say okay now i want a third description which is different from the first two and you will see the way in which children start thinking completely just opens up their mind to being able to implement the forms of thinking it's not about the content we are so caught up with what the child is saying they say no no how can you say that don't say this don't say that no if we want to teach thinking if you want to teach ideology and content yes we can do that but if you want to teach thinking we can do these forms of exercises of this kinds so similarly when when the child says something about um anything you know whatever it's uh, it has uh, it's been taught in the class oh this is what newton said about uh, equ uh, you know gravity now the point again is to go move away from what newton said about gravity and to ask the child to produce arguments how did you conclude from the data and information and in each of these as you can see all these three types each of the hows which i ask the child to do are different forms of thinking and if you pay sufficient attention to training them for each one of these kinds of things they actually get trained in these different skills of thinking in different ways and they get far more they become far more aware on not just saying an argument so one of the things which i really like to do is that uh, uh, you know for example um, suppose you ask a child um, is the earth flat or round and they you know immediately every child in my workshops i do say oh the earth is round then i tell them look i can't see the earth is being round i'm just seeing it as being flat can you give me a reason why you think the earth is round and then they'll say something whatever they've been taught then i go to the other end and say can you give me reasons why the earth is flat and the liberation for children is when they recognize that it's not about right or wrong right it's about thinking i'm not saying right and wrong is not important that is of course very central to all, everything you're doing but if you want to teach thinking then the point is not to hold on to your point of view and say i want that argument for my position but to ask them to keep producing reasons for completely different positions alternate positions and then seeing how they start thinking about it some of they themselves recognize for some things the argument is going to be very difficult so for some things the argument is going to be very easy okay and it may look like absurd uh, but i can tell you what a great skill of thinking it teaches when you take very absurd examples for example you could say um let's say a child describes uh, the leaves as being green now if i tell the child okay can you give me an argument for why the leaf is uh, red in color and then the child the first response is the child start laughing actually it's not even like it's not in scared i mean if it's a workshop like what we do they start laughing they no 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 child the, the, the leaf is not red it's green then i tell them no forget about what it is now can you give me an argument a reason for saying why somebody might be seeing this as red or how you can see the same leaf as red and you'd be amazed at if we worked well enough with the students how they think about this and come up with answers for this and you know there's a lot of this playfulness there there's a lot of joy and that's part of the thinking part of it and thinking is not about this kind of huge stress things which we do but actually a lot of playfulness which is present which can be taught in various ways and so similarly we can teach thinking corresponding to the other context like particular ways of solving problems uh, and for me a very important one of understanding concepts extremely important and as i said because that's really the way in which we order and describe our world we describe our world through the concepts we create and if you teach children i've been looking at i was looking at something in science education for uh, this which i did a series on talks in science education and you know i had asked them to send me some um, books on the school texts of ncert and the telangana group uh, for the tfr which i did and you know i was like really surprised still at some ways of teaching science where they just teach concepts oh this is mass this we call momentum as mass into velocity 
and uh, Newton's law is force is mass into accelerations and things like that. And for me, I think what then you are teaching is you are teaching students how to define these concepts or how somebody has defined concepts and you have to know what they are. We have never, I, I, and that's what I was telling them. I said, how can you teach this to children without connecting those concepts in terms of a history, in terms of how it matters to their daily lives, in terms of a context? Why is it that there's a co concept called momentum, mass into velocity? Why, you, why did somebody even think of that concept? How did it come about? What are the different uh, words which you have used in your own language and so on. And, and whenever you teach concepts or content through context, whenever you teach them, you are actually teaching them thinking about concepts. It's a very special and I think a very important aspect of thinking which you need to keep in mind. And uh, another example which I do is playing with language. Um, like different alternate forms of description etc i think playing with language teaching children to play with language is teaching them a particular skill of thinking that is playing with language means not telling them oh this is correct grammatically correct you should rewrite it in this way etc but just allowing them to do things with language write different nonsensical things it doesn't matter but as they start playing and writing and experimenting you will see how their thinking is going to change so much because why I particularly emphasize this is because thinking has a very close relationship with language. And that's a different topic of discussion altogether, but there's a very close relationship with language. And that's why people will say, um, I, I think better in Hindi than in English or think better in Tamil, Kannada, etc. But you have to understand that the way in which you teach them to work with language, you're actually opening up their thinking. Sometimes teaching language in a very strict sense um, you know, enforcing certain kinds of things restricts their capacity to have free thinking, which is possible. So that is another kind of uh, thing that we need to do. Um, so Latika, if there's some more time or, or what, how many more minutes do you think I can go on? I want to do a last uh, book. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You can uh, conclude and then they can ask a few questions. Okay, then I'll just take another five or ten minutes maximum. Sure, sure. Uh, just to yeah, just to show uh, because as I said, um, you know, looking at we have already seen one kind of typologies of thinking and how you can teach it. I also want to point out to an extension of this in a very different manner, which has often been called as higher orders of thinking. Again, I want to use a typology used in the context of um, uh, uh, an article on teaching sociology. But um, although it's about sociology, it's got nothing to do with that. It's about basic questions of, you know, orders of thinking, higher orders of thinking. And I'm sure many of you know about Bloom's taxonomy and so on. Some of it comes from, uh, some of this comes from that. But the basic idea, again, is to show you, uh, basically expose you to the fact that we can think about thinking in a very different manner. That's all. But as I said, nothing is fixed with these uh, types and orders of thinking. You can always... Um, come up with your own, but it, it's very important to understand this because when certain, as I said, when we say that students are intelligent, when they have capacity to do some things, we often um, evaluate them just on one kind of skill thinking, skills of thinking that is needed. And that is why, you know, even if we have, we have a very good student in a classroom, maybe if you see what happens to them after 30 years, they are not really at the level at which they were there in the school. And there are a variety of reasons for this, right? So um, it's because we focus on certain kinds of thinking skills within the classroom. Now, the higher orders of thinking points to the fact that we can actually, uh, when we think, there are certain types of thinking which are easy to do, certain kinds of things which are far more difficult to do. And the difficulty and easiness is not just about uh, it's just it's just from training. It's not about their mental competence. If you can train the students, if you are aware of this, and if you focus on teaching them about these different type of thinking, you can actually train them to think about uh, different orders of thinking in a different manner. So uh, this is Geertsen's uh, typology, which I think is very useful for us. As I again said, you know, these are all very open for change. But just to show you how one can even think about this, one of the forms of the lowest form of thinking is recalling. So you can ask a child, uh, what did you eat for lunch yesterday? 
that recall, the child still has to think. There's nothing automatic about it. Thinking as a willful act, something willfully you have to do. And the, the child will think a little bit and say, oh, yesterday I had this for lunch. That's a recalling. It's a kind of recollection. And you do make some effort sometimes. But that, and then you are thinking, that is also thinking. But that effort which you make to remember, try to recall something, is not like the effort you make when I give you a broken uh, instrument and say, fix it. So when you're looking at, I give you a broken uh, something, uh, motor and say, fix it, you're looking at it, trying to figure out how to do it. It's different from the thinking you do when you're recalling. Okay, that's a crucial point. Again, different types of thinking, different skills are needed. <clears throat> so the lowest form is recall. And a lot of rote learning, uh, which Mega pointed out, was also about the question of recall. Uh, but there are also very interesting forms of rote learning which go beyond the recall. But it is one of the things about recall. The second one is uh, paraphrasing. To teach, uh, to, it's a different type of thinking, uh, the order of thinking, which is to restate the same thing in different words. It's a great exercise, which you, of course, which you do all the time. You know, our exams are uh, present in it. But the kind of what the main point here is the kind of difficulty involved in paraphrasing is more than the difficulty involved in thinking about remembering something, but it is less than interpreting something. So you can see that's why it's from low to higher order. That is the easiest in some sense, or in terms of effort and difficulties, recalling, thinking to recall is a little bit easier than thinking to paraphrase. Paraphrase is not that difficult because you're given a text and say, okay, tell it in your own words what it is. But interpretation is something far more. You have to read it and understand it. And you have to interpret it in your, in your own words. That's a little more difficult, different type of thinking, what they call as a higher order thinking. And then classification, which is again a uh, uh, little more higher order because in each of these steps, when you go from recall, which is much easier, what did I eat yesterday, I just recall. To paraphrase, I read something and say something. I interpret it, I have to understand what I have read and I put it in my own words. And then I classify things. So here is a little bit about, uh, you know, you have to have some cognitive skills. You have to understand similarities, difference, concepts, various things happen when you ask a child to classify. So already you can see that if in the class you are doing each of these kinds of orders of thinking and then application, application is always, you know, like of course we do in the sciences, it's far more uh, common. Um, but even when you teach social sciences, uh, when you talk about a theory of society, for example, you have to keep, uh, whenever you ask a student, okay, can you apply this to what is there in your own family, in your village, in your city, etc.? You are asking them to do something more than what they have been told. And that's a different type of thinking. The child has to think, I'm going to use this concept to match with the reality of my life and see what matches, what doesn't match. That's more difficult. So what Gertsen points out is that you these are the easiest forms and you keep going more and more effort, different type of thinking. All of these are thinking. And in, a, in one type of thinking, you may use all of them. But different children have different different uh, capacities to do each one of these. That's the crucial point, OK? And as a teacher, you can, um, you can strengthen the skills of each one of this once you know that you can, uh, that there are different types of thinking, orders of thinking which are present. So um, Gertsen gives out of the total 10, the remaining five is analysis, which is, um, you know, that's a lot of what we do is research problems and so on. If you're given a problem or even in life problems, if you're given a problem, how do you solve it? You may break it into smaller parts, try to solve each of the small parts, etc. That's a, when you say be analytical, analyze this problem. That's largely what we try and do. Synthesis is more difficult kind of thinking than analysis because synthesis is to put together and putting together is actually far more difficult. Because in a very simple example, you can always uh, open up a toy or open up a machine, but you kept to putting it back together is a completely different order of skill altogether, different order of thinking altogether. So um, analysis, synthesis, explanation, whenever you train the students to ask for explanations, 
you are training them in you are giving them a different skill of thinking and then evaluation and finally what he calls extrapolation um this is uh, geertsen's piece called rethinking thinking about higher level thinking again you can get it in and the way anywhere uh, or i can send it to you if any of you don't get it uh, extrapolation is taking an idea in one discipline and applying it in another discipline you know a lot of disciplines grow because somebody took an idea in philosophy applied it in science somebody takes one in physics and applies it in biology somebody takes something in biology and applies it in economics and somebody takes something in sociology and takes it to history all of that that's a far more uh, different type of thinking and that's a highest form of thinking according to gertsen um, in terms of the abstractness of it you know so we're moving from very simple low level less effort uh, in terms of abstraction right from um, what we saw from recall all the way to analysis synthesis to explain evaluation etc my point in showing you this uh, and this is the last part i want to show you is how to teach i mean i'm doing this to say that teaching thinking is to teach these higher orders of thinking so which means once you recognize to teach to think is that you can teach each of these skills separately then you focus on that as part of your teaching so you will say in the class for example specific exercises for teaching paraphrasing okay where that's all they'll do for a, a class or two classes or through the course they always do something on always paraphrasing that develops a particular kind of thinking which will be able to read something and put it in their own way pre c writing for example then you do class you do exercises on classifying things in different ways we already talked about description you say this is how the things have to be classified uh, do a different series of exercises in the, not about right and wrong at all all exercises of thinking cannot be ended with what is right and what is wrong answer it has to be with exercises of thinking not exercises on content similarly exercises on applying what they learn to different situations uh, whatever they learn and this is part of the larger problem of teaching um you know converting what you learn in classrooms and things into different situations to local context etc um analysis is a very important uh, skill which can be taught which is you take an idea it can be anything you teach in the classroom and then you just tell them to do the solution to it we don't teach them what the answer to that is they have to do it so a lot of it is like thinking is a lot like laboratory classes you know it's like the lab classes in non science disciplines you just have to sit and do these exercises to strengthen each type of thinking i always see the simplest analogy for me is like um, going to a gym and in the gym you have different weights for your legs and your hands and biceps and triceps and so on and each one you do to build one particular kind of a muscle and similarly this uh, classroom is a gym a gym of thinking skills and you do different exercises to train to improve the different types of thinking skills uh, which are needed for um children so uh, putting together things in different ways again many times um, you tell you 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 know the recombination is an extremely important exercise because uh, what you do is uh, you tell a child to put something together even put an argument together and then we evaluate it and say that's right or wrong but then what we need to do is to say recombine it give me another way to do it do it in a completely different way it doesn't matter uh, but playing with ideas putting ideas together just like you take this uh, jigsaw puzzle and put them together that's a extremely important exercise um you know uh, which we need to have and my last two points is again just to applying those points um teaching how to evaluate an idea many times one of the most and this is again a very important part of what i see as my own function as a teacher is that if a teacher's uh, job i mean if at the end of teaching my students lack confidence or they lose confidence in me or in the subject or in themselves then i have failed as a teacher and sometimes maybe i go to the other extreme and say no this is great etc but it doesn't matter i think a very important form of teaching skill yeah, because this is a this is actually a very important thinking skill because children or even adult students often evaluate themselves and evaluate an idea that they have and unless they have a confidence about it they are not going to take it further they are not going to think about it further so um in this context uh, i think as part of teaching i think it's so important to teach ideas not as what ideas are but as history of ideas 
I, I, you know, for those of you who teach physics or maths or sciences, for example, or the social sciences, if the ideas that you teach are not transmitted just as concepts, but as a history of ideas, you will see how much better the students really uh, will learn from that. And um, finally, the last part is, of course, applying ideas to across disciplines. And this part of the interdisciplinarity, which NEP has emphasized a lot, again, it has to be done at the level of a game, not in terms of whether it's a right application or not. It is just to see what would happen. Let me try it out. Let me try this story. Let me play with this concept here and see what happens. Some of the greatest discoveries in all disciplines in the world have come from this kind of playing with concepts from different things and seeing what will happen. Let's see. And this has to be taught to students as a separate thinking skill right in the classroom. And that's how you develop each of these individual skills. So I hope what I've tried to show you approximately, I mean, quickly, is to show you that it is possible to teach thinking. Um, it needs a lot more thinking about thinking by all the teachers, first of all. But what I've tried to show you is that there are uh, there is enough material for you to look at uh, typologies, the different types of thinking and how to improve the skills of different types of thinking. And that is the only way we can do justice to your child because not all children have the same kind of skills and capabilities for all types of thinking. But if you focus on just one type of thinking, you completely lose out. We do, and we do great injustice to the child. So working with all these different types of higher orders of thinking and different odd types of thinking, giving the skills required, and then leaving it to the child to build on whatever skills they are most comfortable with. I think that to me is the only definition of a teacher is the necessary, essential definition of what it is to teach. Thank you. Thank you, sir. You have set us all thinking. I uh, request my students to ask a few questions. In fact, I encourage them to think and ask. Shreya, Avinash, Krishna Upadhyay has raised the hand. Ha, puche. I request all of you to be very brief and precise in your questions. Puche, Krishna ji. Um, sir, uh, when we are thinking about thinking, how do we look at the idea of thinking in the assessment? Especially because uh, uh, we see that there is a push for more objective kind of assessment everywhere, be it entrance exams for, for anything, universities included. And in universities, may subjective interpretative uh, exams are also cancelled. So, in the classroom, we daily level pe hum assessment ko thinking ke through kaise dekhe? and the broader structure that we impose in that sense, how do we negotiate that? Um, you know, I, okay, I come from South India. So, Sorry, sir. Uh, no, no, I understood only part. I mean, I know yours is. I can, I can repeat the uh, question. No, you know, I, I missed yes. part of it. So basically, the evaluation you are saying, but correct me if I missed out on some parts. Um, you are saying that the, since the exams are all objective type, what does it mean to teach thinking, right? Largely, that's what you are saying. And the, the problem of exams. No, I you know you are very correct. But what my argument is. If you teach your students thinking skills of the kind we have talked about, why do you think they won't do well in objective exams? In fact, they'll do much better. So it takes care of your objectivity of the evaluation. Students are happy because they'll score more. I have never seen a student who has understood a subject deeply who has not scored well. And part of my point is once you train them this part of uh, uh, you know uh, understanding and thinking about these things, they, the problem about the, uh, the, the objective type of exam doesn't even occur for, I mean, doesn't uh, happen for the, doesn't, you know, is not important for them at all because they'll still be able to do a very good job of it. Understanding does not come in the way of either rote learning or uh, whether uh, of any other kind of problems associated with it. I don't know if I understood your question fully and I answered it, but. 
partly he would say that because assessment is so uh, mcq oriented and in mcq yeah. you can't really assess much of thinking it's pure information yeah i'm i'm saying okay i sorry i uh, that's a different point so i'm saying don't evaluate thinking forget let the people who are evaluating let them evaluate what they want leave it to them my role as a teacher is not to worry about what you're going to evaluate me on but what i'm going to communicate and teach to my students and once i enable my students to be thinkers of the with this kind of process then you know they have to they yeah whether they do very well they do not is a different issue i'm not i don't even want to evaluate thinking i'm teaching thinking not to test them on it but to empower them that's all Yeah. Thank you. We also like to maintain this distinction that don't make assessment your goal. Ranjal, ah, uh, please ask your question, and I honestly request you to be very brief. Uh, thank you, sir. So, just my small question is like, we as we have been reading policies and critical thinking and scientific temper has been part since independence. So, I just like to uh, have your comment on what has been the lacune that the implementation. has not been so much possible across time even uh, like nep still emphasizes it on greatly on it like what level is the problem actually uh, implementation policies or what okay you are uh, you are now waved a red flag to a raging bull from bangalore you know this is my topic on which i have written extensively and fought with the continuing fight with the scientists over so many years um you can read some newspaper articles in the hindu and wire on this which i've written which has led to a lot of fight you know i i think it's actually a very political short sighted move by the government in promoting what it or not the government it comes post independence as part of our constitutional duty to have scientific temper without defining what scientific temper is what it is i'm not it is very important to have notions of critical thinking ways of you know the importance of evidence can coming to conclusion and so on but the reason why such kind of naive ideas do not take into a, you know get established in society is because this is being promoted at the uh, why if you look at why the scientific term of temper is promoted for in our constitution is because it wants to eradicate this is the official line eradicate blind beliefs and superstition of our masses it's a very uh urban centric uh anti rural uh, uh, way of looking at the country in which this is how it began okay and even now it's been repeated in such uh, uh you know derisive terms about oh farmers can't think these people are unpad or whatever you say in hindi and therefore it's absurd we know that this the notions of thinking think through Uh, is not happening uh, at, uh, you know to say that people who are not educated in some sense or who are in various rural areas or following certain religious practices are immediately lack of temper in fact you should you read, read the wire thing which uh, people like reni me all of us have been writing you know you see it's only in science institutions there is far more caste practices religious beliefs which are inherent in our systems so Uh, the reason why it is not done is is because it's not democratically understood the idea of thinking it does not inclusive of different kinds of thinking different kinds of people and so on it is uh, more a very political thing to give power to one community within the country so i'm but i'm not saying therefore it's not uh, important it's extremely important to produce different forms of critical thinking um but whether it's going to come through so called uh, how to get it through scientific temper is a big issue because we recognize for example some of the horrendous uh, 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 you know very right wing uh, statements uh, uh, support have come from it sector from very well educated people in the country and uh, country and abroad and one is really very uh, uh, concerned about what happened to the notions of scientific temper even within this community of people so i think Uh, we need to answer what exactly is the scientific temper and how do you uh, want to open it up to a larger humanistic temper uh, i would sometimes call it philosophical temper where you you know teach this which is which is we inclusive uh, it has to be inclusive of caste religion gender it has to uh, treat people with dignity and equality and their opinions and then incorporate them how do we do that is a much larger more complex question 
than just something called scientific temple. Uh, Sonal Shreya Priya. Sakshi, I encourage you all to ask one question at least. Only boys asking is not a good sign in this interaction. Apurva? Uh, sir, may I? Yeah, yeah sure. Please. Uh, sir, when you talk about thinking, articulation of that thinking is as important as thinking. And from, am I audible? Yeah, when you when you answer. can you just uh, rephrase? Uh, yeah, sorry. So when we talk about thinking, we are focusing a lot on thinking, but yeah. articulation of that thinking is thinking is as important as well. Yeah. And irrespective of age, articulation somehow doesn't matches with what a person is thinking. Yeah. So what can we do as an individual to bridge that gap between the articulation and thinking of any yeah. idea? Okay, yeah, that's a very important question. And um, okay, so this again, in many of uh, my own teaching, there's been a very important issue which repeatedly comes, uh, especially when I give students assignments to write and ask them to think about something and to write. And sometimes people write, they're not able to uh, articulate something. And they will say things like, you know, it's there in my mind, I'm not able to say it or as they say in English, right? It's on the tip of my tongue, but I've not found the word, etc. And my quick answer, a little bit of a brutal answer to students is this. To me, my point, I often tell them, okay, the reason why you're not able to articulate it is because you have not thought clearly enough about it. If the thinking had been clear enough to you, you would have articulated it in some way or the other. The in, in difficulty in articulation is the lack of clarity in thinking. Now, you know, sometimes my students will get very angry when I say this, but you know, I work with them on it. I just don't tell them and walk off. We just work with them to make them recognize that. So uh, all I'm trying to say is I'm not saying that the question of artificial is not important. It's extremely important. As I told you, thinking is very closely related to language. Okay. And language is extremely important. If you don't have words for it, you can't express it. We know that. Many people would say thinking is limited by the limits of your language. And, you know, I often use the example of a student I had who came into the course I had started in Manipal and found it very difficult because so much of writing and reading to do. And then I told her, then do it in Kannada because that is our language. I said, the problem you're not able to write is not because it's in English. If your thinking is clear, it doesn't matter. See if you can write it in Kannada, it doesn't matter. And I always say this for bilingual people. If you think you are not able to think about something or write something, go to another language which you feel comfortable and see if you're able to write easily in that. If you are, then that's a question of translation. It's not a question of thinking. So uh, you are right. I think we, there's a lot more which one can say about this. But the, the quick response I would say is when students say they're not able to articulate it, then tell them that they have to clarify the thinking little more, little more, little more, and forget about the problem of language in the articulation. Thank you, sir. That's a very important learning for me as well. Because even our MA and PhD scholars say, I know I'm thinking, but I'm not able to write. Exactly. Achilles, yeah. you want to ask something? We have a student who is a trained engineer and master's from IIT. And now he shifted to teaching. So Achilles Kumar Singh, do you have any question? Engaging with philosophical idea? Anybody else? One last question. Ma'am, I don't have actually. any question. Actually. Okay, okay actually. <laughs> Fine. <laughs> Anybody else? Um, Apurva, please go on. So, uh, I would like to ask, uh, now that uh, we are going to engage with students how do we develop our own thinking like we have to teach them thinking but what are the steps that we can take now because uh, we'll be interacting with so many of them and we'll be exposed to so many new ideas i personally do not think that i'll be able to think to that extent so how we develop our own selves ah uh, how you yeah i think for a lot of this thinking before we teach thinking to others definitely the uh, teachers will have to have understood this act of thinking more deeply. That's very true. And part of it is, is, is to do the same exercises what we do for students on ourselves. For example, 
you know, be becoming self-aware. That's a very important exercise, which the Buddhists would call as mindfulness, being mindful. Being mindful of your own thinking. That is, what happens to you? Why are you not able to think about something at a particular time? What are the impediments which comes to you? Or what kind of thinking are you most comfortable with? What is the relationship in, in which language do you think by, better in your view? So first is for the teachers to reflect on their own capacities as thinkers. Okay. And then I, I genuinely believe that, I mean, after years of teaching this and uh, experimenting on this, that once you recognize that thinking is not just one creature, one humongous, abstract, ambiguous thing, but it's actually a set of different skills of particular kind. It's like this. Suppose I tell a child, oh, go play football. Okay, and just send the child and say, oh, go, go play football and let it play football. And then I, after one year, I look at it and say, what is this? You have not really become as good. I thought you would have just been playing football for one year. Now the child has been playing football for one year. But if I, and, and instead, what do I say? I say, well, you know, playing football is the following. It's broken up into 10 different parts. One particular kinds of dribbling skills, one particular kind of breathing techniques, one particular ways of visualizing yourself on the field, various things of that kind. And in each of them, I strengthen them. I strengthen them as a player. It's not just ambiguous, go play football. So now we say, go think. Doesn't make any sense. Because even this child will come to you and say, what do you want me to do? I don't understand, sir. You're telling, think, go think. What are they going to do? I, I don't blame them. They are confused. So we have to tell them, OK, what I mean by thinking is, like I told you the example, OK, think about how you will describe the room. Simplest example. They'll describe the room. Then say, think about another way of describing this room. They'll struggle. But once you start doing it, you'll see how much the children will start thinking. Because they are the ones who are going to do it. So uh, you're right. It's maybe ambiguous, difficult. The first point you have to do is demystify thinking, not make it very universal term as if everything is under thinking. Think of it as separate skills, like biceps training, triceps training, simple, specific skills. Medha, last question. Medha? Uh, good morning, sir, and good morning, ma'am. Uh, sir, I wanted to ask, like, uh, we live in, a, in an age of social media. And how can we inculcate thinking in students who are so engrossed in the social media and the platforms that it attaches itself with? Mm -hmm. And how do we make them brooding and thoughtful person? Like, sir, uh, yeah. uh, in our childhood, we used to read books. Now they uh, see Instagram reels and Facebook and yeah, whatnot. Yeah. So how do we make them understand this? Yeah. Thank you. OK, you know, I am, it's again something on which I have many opinions on. And I am very anti-technology in this sense, uh, not just for students, even for myself. I don't use smartphones and so on. but. Uh, you know, I also learned something very important when I engage with young kids about this. I think, you know, when I came into it by saying things like you're not reading and this social media is too much, uh, you know, impactful on you, etc. Um, you know, they actually taught me something very different. They said, this is our world now. And this is the way we learn. This is the way we read. And repeatedly, when I went to them, different groups of people, younger people, uh, they all said, look, you have no idea uh, about what you're talking about because we cannot read books in the way you think we should be reading books. That skill is gone. We cannot do any of that. It's too late. We are already deeply immersed in this. Now, so the challenge they pose to me is they're saying, now you tell me what you can do when we are in this media. What are the processes of thinking or whatever we should be doing? Rather than saying eradicate it and come out of it. They are saying we are not going to come out. It's not going to happen. Right. So part of this thing is also various kinds of consciousness raising. Um, and, I, and I think whether they read books or not, um, I think the point about making them uncomfortable in what they believe in. If you can do that, that's more than enough. Books did that for us. Make them uncomfortable. That is, 
make on what the, the foundations on which they stand on make it unwieldy, make it shaky. It can be political beliefs, it can be anything, it can be beliefs about the world. Teach them only that to say, don't be too sure of the things you believe in. And then they themselves will want to know how to come out of it, how to what to believe in, etc. And the social media, you know, I mean, so digital world, social media, if you're talking just of Facebook, as you said, Instagram, etc. I think it's one of the greatest uh, evils in the world, <laughs> in, in the sense, uh, in terms of communication thing. It's just this, it's destroying children. But I'm, I'm talking about the larger digital world, where there's a lot more learning possible, a lot more access to things, a lot more ways of thinking and stuff. And we are seeing, for example, in uh, artists, there is a whole movement called digital art, which has been, some of which has been very fascinating. So there are ways in which you can creatively use the medium. But this uh, question of what's happening to children in the Facebook and stuff, that kind of uh, personal related, not questions of thinking. These are more about personal relations, which are being the most biggest problem here. So um, I know it's a very incomplete answer, but we need to think and talk a lot about this. Uh, I Thank think we should not close this, close this session. You must also be tired <laughs> because this screen no also yeah. makes us tired. I really thank you on behalf of the Department of Education, Delhi University, both of you, Meghaji and Professor Surukai, for sparing your time and for agreeing to do a repeat of this uh, next Saturday for a different set of students. I'm also thankful to my students who um, listened and participated cheerfully. So I look forward thank to you. meeting you next Saturday. So thanks thank you all. so much. It's a great pleasure. And thank you. There are other questions they will send to me and I will send you by email. Sure. Yeah. Okay. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Thank you, It was brilliant you, as Megha. usual. Thank, Thank you. you. Pleasure. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thanks a lot, Nidhati. Okay. Bye bye. Enjoy your remaining Saturday. Bye, bye, Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. Ma it's all right. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>